Hi, I'm Judy Fanari, and this is The Chronic Rift. You know what? I forgot to do something last week, and that was tell you who was going to be our topic for the roundtable this week. Well, he's a time lord from a place very far away, and he's an explorer, and an adventurer, and a traveler, and he's a great friend. Who is he, you may ask? He's the doctor, and we have a panel here tonight just itching to talk about his exploits later on. This week's comic review review is something I liked a whole lot more, Denizens of Deep City by Doug Potter. This was a bi-monthly series from Kitchen Sink Press that was canceled in February of this year due to poor sales. I recently came across it and loved it all to pieces. This is an example of something that only can work in comics. Deep City is full of an odd assortment of characters, but there are too many elements that are conveyed by the art, not to mention a couple of fantasy elements that really wouldn't work as just a prose story, but it's not really very cinematic either. It's very uniquely Judy and I comics. to discuss the how and why of who are. On my left, Joe Duffy, a comics writer and longtime Doctor Who fan. Over on the other side of Judy are Patrick Daniel O'Neill, a freelance writer and renowned Who expert, and Eric Luskin, a producer <laughs> at New Jersey Network, a public TV network and one of the leading importers of Doctor Who into this country. Eric has also produced uh, a bunch of specials on the, the show. The BBC is aware of the fact that they have a very strong foreign market for the show now that to some extent is driven not only by the syndication of the existing material but by new material coming in on, a, on at least some kind of a regular basis. And if it does not come in, then after a while there will be a... <laughs> a declining interest in the series. And if Which that is pretty happens, much what happened. Yeah. Um, once, has, there, has there been a... De well, a lot of well, no, it's not so much declining interest, it, but, but when you look at the phenomenon of how Doctor Who came into this country, it, it pretty much, it usually started with Tom Baker, which was what most stations picked up first, and then they released to Peter Davis, and so they had all that stuff. And it was, there was sort of an initial stream of material that there was um, almost like a faucet with an ever-ending reservoir. And then they released the Troutons and the Hartnells and the Pertwees and all that sort of stuff, and then they ran out. And <clears throat> once everybody had seen everything, and you're only producing um, five or six new stories a year in the movie format, then it becomes really difficult to sustain that momentum that Patrick was talking about. Yeah, it would still have better momentum than Sun, just because you've got 26 years instead of the usual three, four, or five years that <laughs> yes. most TV shows have. So sure. at least, I mean, going through reruns, you have to wait a good half a year before you're going to get around to uh -huh. where. Oh, to, right, to, exactly. You know, like your favorite doctor or something. Has, has any production company on, on this side of, of the Atlantic? Ever well, that's been talked about from time to time. I mean, there was a rumor, uh, which may have been a fact a number of years ago, that a Denver-based Doctor Who fan organization was trying to buy the rights and do all of that kind of thing. And, um, you know, ultimately, I suppose anybody can try to do anything they want to, but there's, there's this little English um, production company with three letters that owns the rights to it. <laughs> <laughs> and but getting a little bit Not only that, the BBC is very dedicated to maintaining it as being for I the disagree. home market. I know that, I mean, I disagree for myself and for a large part of the market. I know that there is an element in any kind of hardcore, if you want to call it intellectual fandom, that has no sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. The fact uh, of the yeah. matter is, humor has been intrinsic to Doctor Surely Who from the very beginning, <laughs> and I mean that is its entire charm. I don't think it's I any agree. accident that the Baker material, which was the first Tom imported, um, Tom Baker. Right. So I keep forgetting. Yes. Tom Baker caught on so quickly because I like I'd been hearing of Doctor Who for years before it was imported, and um, I happened to be spinning the dial. And there was this sort of long-haired, extremely silly-looking but attractive man dodging a robot, you know, and the robot's trying to hit him, and he's ducking and saying something witty, and the robot tries to hit him, he ducks. I was hooked, and then I found out that this was this great sort of intellectual hoo-ha that everybody had been telling me about all these years, Doctor Who. I think that people were as attracted or more attracted to the eccentricity of it than the word of sophistication. I mean, it's kind of nice. It's a very sweet pill to swallow because it is so very eccentric that you like it, and you're getting all these wonderful ideas and information and so sort of casual scientific knowledge and also moral philosophy just sliding down your throat as you swallow it. Until next week when we discuss play-by-mail games, by the way, yes? Aristotle was not Belgian. Oh, come on. Next thing you'll tell me the London Underground wasn't a political movement. Nope. Good night. Good night.